Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another episode. I want to talk about something today that I really have not talked about or written about much. To lay the the groundwork, we know that most of us would prefer to talk about our sex lives rather than disclose the intimate details of our finances. In fact, sexual addiction specialists tell us that the shame around money is as or more intense than even sexual addiction. And this is pretty impactful because money touches everything that we do, right? Money isn't found in nature. It's an artificial creation of humanity. So we're not born with money skills. (laughs) Yet money skills are 21st century survival skill. And finance is a major component of well-being. So as big and as important as this is, Talking about money is a 21st century taboo. This is kind of interesting. It, there, I ran across this on a hotel site of all things. It was a, an article that was a panel presentation at the Global Wellness Summit held in November of 2020. And it predicted several wellness trends for 2021. And the one that caught my attention was something called a great untabooing. It said that wellness gets real about sex, money, and death. One panelist said there's going to be a massive and systemic cultural taboo toppling, suggesting that we're going to see people getting real about money with new financial therapy and wellness approaches. (laughs) <laughs> well, that pretty much nailed what I've been working on over the last year. It's something called IFS, Informed Financial Therapy. Uh, let, let me explain. Money taboos and problematic money behaviors are rarely about the money. So knowing more cognitive action uh, steps around those problems really are only going to resolve about 20% of the behaviors. The solution for the other 80% is understanding that financial well-being doesn't lie in knowing more information about how money works, but in understanding the trauma that underlies harmful financial behaviors. Research shows that 80 to 100%, I often say about 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally. So for most of us, the path to financial well-being doesn't lie in knowing more information about how money works or how mutual funds work or investments or estate planning, or what have you. But in understanding the trauma that underlies the problematic financial behaviors. And this is where IFS becomes a pretty powerful tool for helping people access the hidden beliefs and emotions and stories that drive these seemingly illogical financial behaviors. And we know that every illogical financial behavior, no matter 
if it seems illogical to us or other people, it makes perfect sense when we discover the underlying beliefs held by the person exhibiting that behavior. So, IFS, Internal Family Systems, I discovered this um, modality, this, this therapy, at a joint weekend given by a um, psychologist by the name of Bessel van der Kolk, who I really wanted to hear, and a guy that I never heard of called Dick Schwartz. And they gave a, a it was a two-day weekend before Bessel van der Kolk's one-week workshop. And as I listened to that, I kind of determined that what Bessel was talking about is something that I had 25 years of therapy doing, which is kind of, I'll call it experiential financial therapy, or not financial therapy, experiential uh, group therapy. But uh, Dick Schwartz was talking about this internal family systems therapy where you actually talk to parts of yourself that hold certain beliefs, which was just bizarre. <laughs> I had never heard of this. So I actually asked them if I could switch from Bessel's workshop to Dick's, and they both agreed, and so I did. Long story short, the first IFS uh, session I ever had was with Dick Schwartz in that workshop. I, I uh, drew the high card for the demonstration. And I had a, an extremely profound experience with this. And in fact, got to some things in areas that I hadn't really gotten to in 25 years of uh, experiential group therapy. So it kind of made me a believer very, very quickly. So I started doing my own IFS therapy and still do that weekly. I'm in my fifth year. So it was only toward the end of my fourth year that I started getting curious about learning more about IFS. And I actually had resisted learning more during this process because it was kind of like I didn't want to uh, look at, at who the man was behind the curtain. I, I really wanted to experience it. And I had no intention or didn't even see a way that this necessarily would apply to anything else that I did. But eventually I did take some trainings. And at the end of one training, which was um, July of 2020, I got the notion that maybe there could be a relationship between financial therapy and internal family systems. And I, I'm not going to go into to why I wasn't positive, because the two are, well, I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. But I thought maybe I should experiment a little bit with this. So I have been experimenting, or certainly experimented for, about a year. And I've determined that I think there's um, a lot of promise in this type of therapy. So in IFS informed financial therapy, it really understands that the key to changing problematic financial behaviors isn't to have a strong armed approach of manipulating, shaming, or exiling the behavior of a person's financial beliefs or actions. Now, this is a little bit unique because many financial professionals employ techniques of shaming or manipulating or strong arming their clients into the appropriate financial behavior. At least 
the financial behavior they deem appropriate. And doing this can work for a few days or a few weeks, but it usually doesn't result in lasting financial behavioral change. So the uh, financial therapist's approach to doing this is to actually support the client in uh, getting to know their system and getting to know, to know the various parts that are driving this seemingly illogical, air quotes, <clears throat> financial behavior. Now, one thing to understand, because IFS, when the first time I heard it, I thought, this is kind of whacked. <laughs> IFS is an evidence-based therapeutic treatment. Uh, it's called EBT, evidence-based therapy. And uh, EBT is any therapy that has shown to be effective in peer-reviewed scientific experiments and journals. So this has been in development for over 30 years. And Dick Schwartz was trained as a structural family therapist. And family therapy has the, the, the belief that there isn't one person who's a problem. That, especially with families, when you have the, the kid that's the black sheep or doing the drugs or acting out in some way, that oftentimes the family thinks, oh, if we can just solve this kid's problem or fix the kid, then everything's great. And the problem is the kid. A uh, family therapist will say, no, the, the problem is the family and everybody has an equally important role in producing the behavior of the, quote, problematic, end quote, child. So, as and typically, um, family therapy focuses on the present, it doesn't really focus on the past. But as he was working with people, he noticed that people started talking about their parts and the past. And think about it. How many times have you said, eh, you know, a part of me wants to do this and a part of me wants to do that. And you, and like in uh, finances, well, there's a part of me that wants to really save and there's another part of me <laughs> that wants to spend. So I think all of us do this. And so he, he became interested in this and the, and the past indicated that there was a power in past traumatic uh, experiences. Now, these parts of ourselves are our little inner personalities that we have. Like I said, it's a natural phenomenon. Trauma forces these parts out of their natural states into something destructive. And by talking to these parts, they can relax because they're protecting parts of ourselves that were hurt. Now, a part is like an ego state, but IFS takes parts a lot more seriously than that. IFS believes that we're all multiple personalities, and that is not a sign of patho pathology or being having a, a mental uh, psychosis of some type. They've actually found that it's the nature of the mind to be multiple. All these parts are with us in our life, and some are active and some are dormant, just waiting to be activated or triggered as such. Our parts are pretty in, important to us. I mean, they help us survive, they help us thrive. But when they're traumatized, they're forced out of their natural states and they, they become these extreme managers or exiles, as uh, the language is in IFS. They take on burdens, which are beliefs. And in so, uh, some cases of this trauma, it's around money or the trauma comes out affecting a money decision. And now here's a real important part of IFS theory that just beneath these parts is something called the self or your self. 
called self energy. And what Dick has found in working with this over 30 years is everybody has this self that really knows how to heal the system. So the key is helping uh, a person or helping yourself get to this self energy. So again, when you suffer a trauma, there come beliefs that associate or attach to that part. And in IFS, we call these beliefs burdens. Uh, culturally, we, we mistake these beliefs, these burdens, for the role that the part's playing. And it, it's really hard to be compassionate for the burden. Parts carry burdens, come from these experiences. So we can actually jettison the belief, the extreme belief from the system, which by and of itself doesn't define the part. So these parts of us that are carrying this pain, this shame, uh, we call exiles. And these burdened exiles overwhelm the self. And there's uh, many types of burdens. One, one uh, burden that is usually really present in financial trauma are what we call legacy or family burdens. These are beliefs that are actually passed on to you and that your parts pick up that come from your parents or grandparents. So the whole basis of dealing with our system uh, with IFS is that we want our parts to feel safe enough to unburden, to jettison these beliefs so that, that they can revert to their natural role. The first step in changing a harmful financial behavior then is helping to build what's called a self to part relationship with these wounded parts. It's um, getting curious about them, um, showing compassion toward them, which is very unusual because we tend to do just the opposite. The second step is helping those parts begin to tell their stories, their beliefs, and these burdens. And you might be surprised to know that even when it comes to money, every part, even those that appear to be the problem, really has our best interests at heart. Now, this is a little hard to, to, to absorb. You mean even the part that wants to spend money and not save has my best interest at heart? Yes. Um, I've never found a part. And I'm sure Dick will say he's never found a part. He's had a lot more experience than I have. That doesn't have the uh, person's best interest at the core of that being. Even our critic, and most every one of us has a critical part, has our best interests in, in mind. In, in, in mind. So these, these parts, every one is valuable. They become burdened. They're forced into these extreme roles. They can be unburdened and return to a natural state. It's just like a kid that takes on a role to help a family survive. Kids will gladly leave those roles and get back to something that is much more normal. So every symptom or financial behavior is a part trying to keep you safe. We need certain parts to be in certain roles. And within each of these parts, we have a certain variations. Most therapists try to get you to stand up to and manage these parts. Most financial planners do the same. For example, I had a client that couldn't save. She wasn't an overspender. She just couldn't save. 
I helped her to try, or, uh, well, to not try, really, and control the part that didn't want her to say. But to become curious about why the part does what it does. And through this, she found out the positive role the part played in her system. Now, in her case, the uh, parents had stolen her savings multiple times when she was growing up. So spending the money was a way that she could derive some benefit from it because to save meant it would disappear. So that was the part's viewpoint and reality. So these parts are like little kids in the family that get stuck doing things they don't want to do to keep the family safe. And many of them are still very young. <laughs> As one of my clients uh, said during a, a IFS financial therapy session, oh my God, is no one in here concerned? We have a 12 year old running the business. <laughs> and this is really, really true. We can have these very undeveloped, small, young parts of us that are making these adult decisions. So the goal is to get to know the dynamics that are in our system forcing these young parts into these roles. And we want to improve the relationship between the self and these parts. So ultimately, uh, one of the goals is to set up a dialogue between you and your financial managers, you know, the one that is making the problematic financial decisions. And so as you start doing this, it's often that a part that hates the financial manager jumps in and starts talking. So in IFS therapy, the IFS therapist would ask that particular part to step back and let you have a dialogue with this part. And when it does, it's there, there seems to be released another person within you that is curious and calm. When you get into this place, you can get the financial manager to feel safe enough to tell you how it got into that role. And in IFS, this is called unblending. You know, many of us as kids had a really poor attachment to our caregivers. Some theory says that it's not possible. If you, if you didn't have really good parenting model to you, you're not going to know how to parent yourself. IFS suggests that within all of us, there is this self energy that knows how to parent even without any external modeling or mirroring. When parts open the space for the self, it knows how to heal the system. And this has been proven over and over again in the 30 years that uh, Dick Schwartz has been uh, doing this. The energy of the self is summed up with uh, what they call the eight seeds that are pretty important for healing our system. Curiosity, calm, confidence, compassion, creativity, courage, clarity, and connectedness. And this is the energy that takes over when our parts begin to open up. Maybe uh, finally just adding that uh, most of the time, the part really doesn't like the role that it's been forced into. Parts can't die or be created. They are there. They've always been there and they will continue to be, be there. Oftentimes parts believe that they need to protect the self and they really don't trust the self to lead. This is really, really normal. So reversing this is a big part of healing the financial trauma. It's really important that you have uh, permission from all these protectors. There's, there's three types of parts. There's the exile that's been exiled, that's been wounded. 
There are protectors, of which two, there's two types of protectors. A manager that tries to manage everything so that the exile isn't set off or triggered. And then there's firefighting protectors that when the managers fail, they have a scorched earth policy to shut down the, the exile. Oh, there's so much um, to get in into with with this. But what I, I want to uh, leave you with is um, Dick Schwartz says that um, what he calls himself is a hope merchant, selling hope to the parts. And I have seen people make faster progress with IFS informed financial therapy than I have with, um, if, if there is a normal financial therapy with, with the type of financial therapy that I've witnessed in the past. So this is pretty bleeding edge. So far, I think I'm the only person doing this. <laughs> Makes it really bleeding edge. But I have a hunch it's going to catch on. I have a hunch it's going to catch on. So maybe I can go more into this in the future. If you think this sounds a little bit strange or crazy, I get it. I was there. But actually, when I explain this to folks, most people say this makes perfect sense. So I think you'll be hearing more about this and you'll probably be hearing more about it from me as uh, I go on. So thanks uh, for joining me. We'll chat next time. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.